Next up, we have Brian Granger. Uh, Brian comes to us today uh, as the Senior Principal Technologist of AI Platforms at AWS. Uh, some of you may also know him as a professor of physics and data science at Cal Poly. Uh, Brian is going to talk to us about accelerating AI and ML using open source. So please, a round of applause for Brian. Come on up, Brian. Thanks, sir. Hi, everybody. Great to be here today. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk to you about open source uh, software in AI and ML at AWS. First, a bit about me. Um, in the introduction, you got a little bit of this, wanted to add a few things. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Project Jupiter, and I've been working in open source for the last 20 years, involved in a number of different projects uh, along the way. And uh, let's dive into this. So as we all know, it's an exciting time to work in AI and ML. The rate of change, I think, is far beyond any of us could have imagined uh, we'd find ourselves in. Uh, at this time, and that makes it really exciting, but also really challenging. So what are customers telling us at, at AWS? One of the things they're telling us is that they want to use popular open source software for AI and ML. Uh, they view open source software as a source of rapid innovation, and they want access to that innovation. So from PyTorch to Jupyter, Pandas, NumPy, uh, Spark, Langchain, uh, Ray, Dask, and many other open source projects. At the same time, customers are telling us that they have challenges in using open source software. It's difficult to keep up with fast moving open source software. It's difficult to configure, deploy, and operate open source software. Uh, we find that customers want to use the open source software with the AWS pillars of operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, efficiency and cost optimization. And uh, they also want confidence that the open source software they're using is sustainable in the long term, stable and continually innovating. So I want to talk to you about uh, two strategies we have for addressing what we're hearing from customers. The first is that AWS and SageMaker specifically offer AI and ML services that bring the value of popular open source software to customers to address these needs and challenges. Some examples, PyTorch. Uh, we offered integration uh, with PyTorch in SageMaker training jobs, SageMaker inference endpoints, uh, the SageMaker distribution, which is a, a package of open source software a distribution uh, for uh, ML, and SageMaker Hyperpod. Uh, for Jupyter, we offer Jupyter integration through SageMaker Studio and SageMaker Studio Lab. For Spark, we have Amazon EMR, AWS Glue for Spark, and you can use those things also from SageMaker. Uh, the Transformers library from Hugging Face. Uh, we offer integration with Hugging Face through training jobs and inference endpoints. And there's many other examples of, of open source projects that we've integrated into our products and services uh, to serve the needs of customers. But there's a second strategy that I'd like to focus on in this talk, and that is AWS is also participating in and contributing to open source. Uh, this part of it is uh, sort of deep in my DNA as a professional, and so it's really fun to talk about this. Uh, one example uh, is AWS is a founding member of the PyTorch Foundation and has worked with Meta to create uh, the TorchServe project in 2020, which is an inference server for PyTorch. And in this talk, I want to cover briefly some of the recent contributions we've made to Jupyter, Langchain, and PyTorch. So let's dive in. Project Jupyter, uh, you may be familiar with the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, these days, it's a foundational tool in AI and ML. It's a multi-stakeholder open source project, and uh, AWS has been involved for, with Jupyter for a number of years. We have a team shown here that works full-time on open source, employed by AWS, and Jupyter is one of uh, their key areas of focus. So I want to talk about two particular contributions that we've made recently. One is Jupyter Scheduler. Uh, so Jupyter Scheduler is an open source extension for Jupyter that enables users to run and schedule notebooks as jobs. We're finding a number of different usage cases for this. One is reporting, uh, running a notebook on a regular basis and producing an artifact that humans can then read uh, as a report. It's a lightweight way for people to move notebooks to production. It's good for experimentation where you want to run one notebook many, time for, many times for different parameters. 
and it's useful for scaling out where you've been working interactively in a notebook, but you want to run that notebook then on a larger instance type. Uh, Jupyter Scheduler is governed uh, by Project Jupyter and was contributed by AWS. So if you're using and have installed Jupyter Scheduler, uh, there's a number of ways to quickly run a notebook uh, as a job or schedule that notebook. There's flexible job options. You can configure parameters for the notebook, pick instance type, uh, conda environments. You can both run the notebook immediately, a single time, or put it on a periodic schedule. And it uses an immutable snapshot of the notebook so you never doubt what version of that notebook was run. It's easy to uh, manage jobs. You can download and view outputs of the run notebooks or the logs, delete jobs, rerun jobs, and then edit uh, the uh, schedules. Most importantly, Jupyter Scheduler is extensible. The default background, uh, back end for Jupyter Scheduler just runs on the system where Jupyter is running. That would often be your laptop. Amazon SageMaker offers a back end for Jupyter Scheduler that runs these jobs on AWS. Uh, that back end is also open source. Um, the user interface is extensible, so these extensions or these alternate backends can offer different job options that are uh, sort of specific to the backends. And it's also not specific to just notebooks. A, a given backend to, can declare which file types it's capable of running. Next, Jupyter AI. As we know, there's a lot of work being done on generative AI and a lot of interest in accelerating the work of data scientists and machine learning engineers and practitioners using generative AI. And Jupyter is diving into this with Jupyter AI. And there's two primary use cases here. One, using notebooks as an AI playground. And the second is using AI as an assistant as you're writing code and working in Jupyter. Again, Jupyter AI is governed by Jupyter, contributed by AWS. Some of the design principles, and this really follows the design principles of Jupyter itself. It's vendor neutral. So there's a growing list of model pro providers that are supported in Jupyter AI. It's transparent and traceable. Everything's open source. You can look at the prompt templates we're using. You can customize prompt templates. You can bring your own models to this. Um, it's collaborative. Um, oops, went too fast. Um, and also, as I said, very configurable uh, and extensible. Uh, the first thing we offer is a, a double percent AI magic command that turns Jupyter Notebooks into a generative AI playground. Um, any of the providers, any of the models that we support, um, you can do this with. And uh, we support the rich output of notebooks. So for example, here is uh, Claude generating markdown, and we're able to render that markdown in a nice form in the notebook immediately. Same is true for models that generate images. We're able to render those immediately in the notebook. What's nice about this is you no longer have to take screenshots of the various model playgrounds to share with your colleagues. You can actually share a reproducible Jupyter notebook with them showing the explorations you're doing. The second thing that Jupyter AI offers is a chat UI. Um, this is a side panel. Um, you can pick which model you want to use uh, for the chat UI. And this allows you to have a, a generative AI assistant as you code. Um, you can uh, select blocks of code in notebooks and text files and choose to include that in the context of your request. So you can say, pick a cell. What Can you tell me what's wrong or help me debug the, the code in this cell? You can take code snippets that the models generate, insert them back into notebooks easily. Um, it's also collaborative. So uh, it, as of JupyterLab 4.0 and Notebook 7, Jupyter has support for real-time collaboration. So you can deploy a Jupyter server on, on common infrastructure, and multiple people can log into that and share notebooks and edit the notebooks and view them at the same time. What's nice about this is if you're running Jupyter AI on a server like this, uh, the chat also becomes uh, collaborative. There's just, this is just a start. Um, there's many ways that we are finding that we can improve this. But we're, part of, I think, the challenge here is we're all still trying to figure out what are the right patterns for us to interact with uh, generative AI assistance, and how does that interact or, or interplay with the human collaborations we have? Right now, a lot of the pattern uh, is that we'll all interact with the AI individually and then interact with each other as humans as if nothing happened. What we're finding with Jupyter AI is that's really challenging, partially because of transparency reason, right? That traditional model or that, that model, I think, is, that is the default now, 
doesn't do a good job of showing other people what artifacts that you're bringing to the table were generated or edited or uh, contributed by uh, a generative AI. In Jupyter AI, we're trying, as I said, to increase transparency so that when code is inserted into a notebook, we're tagging the metadata of that cell with the model that was generated. All right, again, transparency is part of the picture here. Um, Jupyter AI also has slash commands. Um, there are slash learn and slash ask slash commands that enable you to ask questions about your local files. So you can say, let's say you, you're, you checked out a, a repo from GitHub and you'd like to get a sense of what, what is in that. You can say slash learn that local directory on your hard drive and we will go through, parse all the code, parse all the mark markdown files, call the embedding model of your choice and store it in a local vector database. Now I should note, um, we support a, a many different model providers. Data privacy, we're finding, is really important to users. So if you want, we also support local models. So you can do this with local models and your data will never leave the system where Jupyter AI is running. Once uh, Jupyter AI has gone through and indexed all this content, you can use slash ask to then ask it questions about that content uh, that you've indexed. The slash generate command allows you to generate an entire Jupyter notebook from a natural language prompt. This is an example uh, shown there of a notebook that was generated. Um, I guess here the prompt was a notebook that explains how Matplotlib work, works. Um, we're using Langchain underneath the hood to break that down into a set of subtasks, to have it generate an outline for the notebook, uh, and then fill in the code for each of the sections. It's not perfect. It depends a lot on what model you're using, but it's we're finding that it's highly useful, enables you to go from zero to having a lot of code written very, very quickly. And so we're really excited about the opportunities for things like this. Um, in an upcoming release, you can add your own slash commands. One thing we're finding with both learn and ask and the generate command is that users want to plug in their own sources of knowledge and their own language models, right? It's not that you're gonna have one vector database that you want to ask questions over. In a large organization, you might have dozens or hundreds of different vector databases or other sources that you want to retrieve content from and dozens of models. And so one way we're allowing extensibility is through slash commands. So if you want to have a set of slash commands that talk to your models and your sources of knowledge, you can do that. We're also working on natural language routing. So even without a slash command, there will, we will be able to route commands based on the natural language prompt to the appropriate uh, vector database or model behind the scenes. Again, all this is extensible, all of it's open source. Come and work with us on this. We're really excited about this. Um, also like to talk briefly about our contributions to Langchain. Um, Langchain is a, a, a recent, but a, a, it has become a very popular open source tool for building applications with language models. Um, it provides a full set of abstractions for building applications. Uh, it's become very popular with customers of AWS who are building LLM applications using AWS services. We've been contributing since the very start of Langchain just over a year ago. And here's some of the, the integrations we've built with Langchain. Um, you can use uh, any of the models uh, that you can uh, deploy or use on Amazon either through Bedrock or SageMaker endpoints um, as part of Langchain. And then we've also built integration uh, with Langchain for uh, Amazon Kendra for enterprise search uh, in RAG, OpenSearch RDS, MemoryDB for additional vector surf, Neptune, graph retrieval, and then integration with TextRack, Comprehend, and Personalize uh, as well. One last thing, um, a, a more recent contribution that just came out at reInvent a few weeks ago is a new Amazon S3 connector for PyTorch. Um, a lot of the data that all of you are using to train models or fine tune models is on S3. And uh, because of that performance and your ability to load that data quickly, in addition to save and load model checkpoints is absolutely critical. So this was launched uh, at, at uh, reInvent 2023 uh, at the beginning of this month. It's a new S3 connector for PyTorch. Um, 
this is a, a based on a new runtime that is being built for uh, high performance read focused uh, access to S3. Um, at the core, there's a Rust library. It's wrapped up into Python and then adapted to the PyTorch uh, usage cases. For, so for loading training data from S3, um, you can load data up to 40% faster than you can through other approaches to working with S3. Um, it offers both iterable style and map style data sets that are compatible with Torch Utils data and also Torch data. Um, and then for model checkpointing, you also see a similar 40, up to 40% performance improvement for that. And you, importantly, you don't need to save your model checkpoints to the local disk. You can go straight to S3 with this. So to wrap up, open source software provides a significant value in AI and ML. Rapid innovation, open collaboration, and best practices and open standards. There's many, many opportunities to participate in open source communities and contribute. And now's a great time to get involved and join us in working in these open source communities. Thank you very much. Excellent.